Hey everybody, this is Sam Seeley and welcome to another episode of the Builder Series. Today, we've got CEO Chris Duff is here with us of Phone Bank. Chris is gonna break down to us how Phone Bank is creating a bridge to Web3. Chris, how are you doing today? And, and if you can explain exactly what you mean when we talk about creating a bridge to Web3. Thanks, Sam. Pleasure to be here. Phone Bank offers a unique bridge, as you mentioned, to Web3 targeting mobile-first, cash-based economies. And what really makes this unique is that we utilize prepaid airtime, which is probably the most ubiquitous digital asset globally, as well as other mobile generated payment types. So mobile money, bank transfers as a medium of exchange and using USDC as a bridge to all the leading L1, L2 protocols. So let me go back to, to prepay because a lot of people listening, as you mentioned, that may not be familiar with this market. Like why is there even a market for, pe for prepaid airtime? Could you maybe explain that dynamic to the listener and explain why, why this even exists? Sure. First and foremost, prepaid is the predominant sort of way most people on the planet, not just this region, pay for their mobile telephony service. And the reason being is when these carriers got started and until today, they don't have bank accounts or they're underbanked or they choose because from a budgeting standpoint, they want to pick and choose the amount that they want to pay at and whatever period basis. And so as a result, that's a, that resulted in how people consume their mobile telephony. And so it's a pay-as-you-go system. And it, and the other aspect of that is many people globally on, on an absolute basis just don't have the type of money that we do here in, in the West and, and they don't have credit. And so the last thing that traditional sort of addressing systems, so you can't like put a bill in the mail, they don't have uh, bank accounts with debit cards with, that enable recurring payments. And so it's the only way that the carriers can provide an economically viable model is to require their users, subscribers, payers to, to prepay for service. Ah, uh, okay. Okay. Yeah, that, that makes sense. That makes sense now. So you have people that, that have these prepaids, they're buying them like pay as you go for the minutes. And then out of that, you're saying uh, essentially that they have excess prepaids and maybe they want to utilize that to, to send it because they're not using it. So they, they'll resell it or even maybe could use that for purchases. Is that what we're talking about here? Yeah. So the one nuance in, the, in this is that while some people might have access per se, they use it as a type of wallet, right? That's really where this solution has evolved. And it starts with the, the SIM card. There's 8 billion prepaid SIM cards globally, right? And they over-index across emerging markets. There's over a billion within Sub-Saharan Africa alone and effectively what these are simple store value accounts, right? I go to a shop, retailer, pay on, pay in locally in whatever means available. And I now have this account with value on it that in many cases is transferable. I can use for talk, text, data, and mo mobile money. And so what Phone Bank is created is a type of software that sits on top of that, as well as that global, that network of individuals, Agents, retailers, whether they're formal or informal, that allow you to add value or transact on that wallet. That makes a, a lot of sense. I'm glad you you walked us through that. It makes complete sense. So yeah, going back to just to recap, make sure I completely understand what the listeners here. You have basically an unbanked society or underbanked society, and you have these mobile phones. Everyone needs a mobile phone. And you can buy prepaid. So that's why this whole market even existed to begin with is there's no debit cards like here. We buy these annual, these monthly plans with our carriers. But then because of that, it has then grown into, hey, wait a minute. This is also a way to have my own mobile banking system, <laughs> essentially. I have extra money. I, I buy minutes and it's there. And then here comes phone bank now saying, hey, you have all this money stored up as prepaids maybe the money that you've earned or whatever that you've been using, here's now a way to transfer that into a way that now you can use it for payments. Exactly. And maybe, so the sort of analog is what if M-Pesa meets the blockchain? It's now an open architecture over the top, meaning that I don't have to go around in the different mobile carriers to strike partnerships or the banking solutions because it's just a piece of software that enables them to utilize the services that they have available to them today. But now we orchestrate this sort of next level of capability that allows them to access Web3. The other aspect of this that is not necessarily so obvious, I'll take you through a demo 
in a little bit, which we'll share a little bit, a little bit more about what we do. But we are a like a two sided marketplace in this. So maybe that using and Pesa meets blockchain, it's really maybe in Pesa meets like Uniswap, right? Where effectively at a high level or simplified level, we're enabling the democratized on-chain FX enablement, where we can tokenize that sort of real world asset on-chain through this marketplace where we work with, whether it's individuals in the case of prepaid airtime or licensed OTC providers in their respective local markets, and even money services businesses that can provide this sort of fiat to crypto on ramping, whether that be airtime, mobile money, bank transfer, giving us this full range of payment mix and types that a user now can pick and choose. And it's also really familiar with within these respective markets. And the significance of the prepaid airtime is that it's like at the bottom of the pyramid in terms of accessibility for people on the planet, right? And whether and they can bootstrap liquidity in markets where they might have a broken financial system and they can't ordinarily get access to to crypto or do those sort of transfers or have access to bank accounts, which is the case in with traditional sort of P2P exchanges. Very exciting. Let's explain phone bank, the building phase. I'm curious to know your process of building this out. Like how did you, how, how did this start off and expand and then connect please into where, how you got involved with Circle and how you're leveraging Circle as well? Sure, sure, sure. Our first product actually was like a Facebook messenger bot. Probably broke all the rules, but we just figured out a way to match that sort of payment with the user base. And that was validated that people would buy from us and transact in this way online. But as we evolve, we now have this suite of dApps and APIs that allow us to work with builders who we want to enable on and off ramping this sort of bridging process from into the real world into Web3 utilizing USDC as that gateway. And in terms of our introduction to, to Circle, I followed you guys for a long time through some relationships with some wide busters, but ultimately it was a, an introduction. We participated in the Visa Fast Track program and they're like, hey, you should talk to these Circle folks in terms of what you're doing. And I think they'd be really helpful in your building. And we started out with the Circle Mint product as core to our solution. And they've evolved to now include things like gas station, where we can work with third parties and enable a more seamless on-ramping and application experience for their end users. Very nice. I would love if you can maybe walk us through what this looks like. You said you have a demo. Would love to share that right now. So what we have here is our pay widget DAP, and this enables a user to fund their crypto wallet. In this case, it's going to be a non-custodial crypto wallet. And someone in Kenya is going to use their NPESA, which is their mobile money account, to fund USDC on Avalanche. And so once they've entered the amount that they want to fund, we validate their number to make sure it is a working prepaid number in that network. And in a lot of these markets, you have to use, use these services. And this is why I talk about mobile generated payment types is that it utilizes the communications protocols and infrastructure of the local carrier. And once that's validated, we match the user to a local liquidity provider. And that liquidity provider is matched based on price, availability, and liquidity. And once that's confirmed, the funds or tokens that are released to the destination wallet of the, the customer or market taker in this case. And what's amazing about this is that this is a micro cross-border dollarized immutable transaction. I know that's a, a big phrase, but essentially we sent money to the other side of the world with no friction. And it's a relatively small amount, 161 kids, kids or Kenyan shilling, that equates to about a dollar in, in USD terms. The types of applications for this, think gaming or all types of digital goods services. If you have a any type of content, if you're in a social media influencer, you, you're selling music or you want to get tipped or if it could even be like you're a global marketplace business like an Uber and you want to get paid and receive payment and you'd be happy to do it in crypto dollars because you don't, then you don't have to worry about the international Forex, treasure management, or in the case, traditional card types, debit cards, credit cards, what have you, you don't have chargebacks. 
right? Because this is on the blockchain. No, that's incredible. Thanks for sharing that. So you were talking about some of the the solutions that this has, right? So you talked about, I guess, micropayments in, in, in markets. So you have digital goods. Now, what are some other potential use cases and, and solutions that this that you're seeing that your service is being used in? Stable coins or crypto purchases are just really a proxy for broader global digital commerce and as our sort of digital goods and services. So we've had people that have sold concert tickets with this, right? If you're doing like an online concert, well, how are you going to get paid if you're in Kenya and you have fans in Nigeria, right? We've had people use for donations. Hey, I'm fundraising for this event. I send a dollar, et cetera. We've even had people explore. We don't have a, a live version of this, but like churches, right? I have a congregation across the continent. I'd want to, someone what their congregation might want to contribute. How do you do that? To make it worth worth the while to make it easy for folks. And then there's the traditional e-commerce realm of things, in-app purchasing, is, et cetera, that are really hard across these markets, or at least can, in, to be consistent and cost-effective without this type of technology solution that we've brought to bear. Very neat. Very neat. I wanted to go back. So you touched on the fact that you use Circle Mint and then you also touched on the Circle Gas Station. For the listeners that are unfamiliar exactly, okay, how do these two products, how, how, how is Phone Bank leveraging these two products? Can you maybe, let's start with Circle Mint. How is Circle Mint being used? Well, we don't necessarily describe ourselves this way. We are a type of exchange solution. And so having ability to mint USDC on all the leading L1, L2 protocols cost effectively is a pretty powerful solution where it gives us uh, a type of global treasury asset management solution in a box, right? I've said this before, but I, I we couldn't do what we do without this type of technology and solutions like, like this, where a, a small business to now have a global infrastructure and reach without having relationships with thousands of different correspondent banks to make this thing happen. And oh, by the way, it probably wouldn't be cost effective because each of those counterparties would have to take some type of fee in the process, right? And so the other aspect, and so that, that's a pretty problem thing. I think Triple Mint it uniquely solves that, that issue for us. And I come out of many different businesses, whether it's telecommunications, as well as payments, but like telecommunications, where a lot of this, a lot of the global infrastructure is really predicated on these counterparties having like bank accounts, bank, bank type relationships. And oh, we settled these transactions and now you can make good on the payment. That's what the, the blockchain was designed to do organically. Very good. I like the way you describe that, the global FX, it, it puts you right in position. And then Circle Gas Station. Yeah. And so we now have developed a number of applications that are on chain where we have to take into consideration our the end user, sort of their experience usability of the tokens that are delivered to them. And maybe it's in conjunction with our partner. So having the ability to bake in sort of gas fees so that once they the user receives the USDC, they actually do something with it. The last thing we want to do is create this sort of stranded pools value that end users can't use. And we want to be a solution provider for our partners. And this is a great tool for that. Nice, nice. Now, I did see in a recent recent development that uh, Phone Bank actually partnered with the uh, Avalanche to, to drive the adoption of USDC and EuroC stable coins across Sub-Saharan Africa. Let's talk about that a little bit here. So what was the background and what are we going to see in the future? Yeah, so it all started, we worked with a number of other partners in the past 18 months and with great success, We where we've literally been the leading on-ramp for USDC on those particular protocols within that time period. And as a result, many people came to us and were like, hey, we saw what you did and we want to make that type of impact too within the sub-Saharan market, which we think has huge potential. We, But what we did is we evolved this suite of DAOs and APIs that I would describe probably now as the simplest way to bridge into Web3 both on and off ramps, we offer a suite of no and low code solutions that builders now can come to us and incorporate into their existing workflows or do the MVP. They don't have to clue these weird things together like we did when we got 
started. Two people in a garage or a hackathon now can, within minutes, start bridging or on-ramping and off-ramping to and from Web3 with our, our tools. And so what this program with Avalanche is designed, or Ablabs is designed to do, is pour gasoline on this opportunity to drive new builders into the AVAX ecosystem and using phone bank and the tools we provide as that sort of medium to vehicle to get there. We've been given plenty of resources. So new builders that come to us that could drive new users, we can provide resources around user incentives to get them bootstrapped in their grace across the region. Very neat. Very neat. And I'm going to say this right now. We're going to work together to create a workshop because I know that there's I, there's always every single week someone looking for on and off ramps and there's tons of great builders throughout Africa. So we'd love to work with you on that to figure out how we could really show builders in our community and beyond of how to leverage technology and start their, like you said, begin their own startups over the weekend and really get to start experimenting with what this technology can do and bring to their own communities. We'd love to work with you on that. Yeah. And one one example, there is a, a rickshaw driver in Ghana who we're working with. And I want to get out a, a case study on him, but where he set up a, we have this sort of sub product called the Instant Merchant Account. Or, or DAP. And where someone within minutes can create a payment link with artwork called action invoice amount, and they can even generate a QR code. And he's got it affixed to the back of his chair in his rickshaw. And so people can pay him in local Ghanaian CD and he gets USDC settled into his wallet on it on his phone. And this is the type of thing where, again, it uses all the existing license infrastructure but it's really just this orchestration layer. And this is the beauty of this, of the blockchain is you, you can create this composability layer where people can build their own bespoke financial solution off the different aspects of the systems that are there. And payments is only a, a part of it, right? It could be security. It could be all types of digital rights management. There's so many different things that we haven't really, we've always scratched the surface in terms of what we even as an entity want to do. There's still more things we want to, we're looking at in terms of telecommunications infrastructure and settlement that we see we could grow into over time. So really excited and lo really looking for this opportunity and, and feel free to share my information or our information so people can get in contact with this to get started. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. We're going to, we're going to work, especially, I love this whole idea. I love to help people just to even something, even what you just, you know, mentioned with this driver, something as simple as that, where someone can build it, they can start to use this in the real world. I think that is how we create understanding of the technology when people can build these things and it, and they really see that real world benefit and value. So yeah, we're going to work. We're definitely got to work on that. So look, thank you so much, Chris. It, it's been great. We covered a lot about phone bank. We talked about the integration, as you just mentioned, with existing payment methods, the conversion of airtime and, and mobile money to USDC, the access to global and borderless digital economy. Uh, you hit on affordable and reliable gas fees, non-custodial integration. You've really hit on so many different aspects that phone bank is providing. What am I missing here? What in, in, in conclusion, what are some of the final things you'd like to make sure that we convey to all the, all our listeners? We are in literally the, the simplest bridge to Web3 across many global Southern markets. And while we started in Sub-Saharan Africa, this solution works across uh, many regions, whether it's LATAM, Central, Southeast, Asia, where this telecommunication in infrastructure is the same exact way. They utilize the GSM protocols. So it's this is something that, knock on wood with time, we want to expand it to more regions. We're looking for partners to help us go there. And I think this is something that's near and dear to both of our hearts, Sam. But I do think by empowering many more people pass this, what's traditionally looked at as a tech bro technology and making it more accessible to the average person globally. I think that's the original dream of Web3 and, and why we're in the space. And I think in partnership with Circle and many of our other partners, uh, I think we can get there. This takes time. 
Chris, I think that's a perfect send off to this conversation. Thank you so much for your time. For those listening, as you mentioned, we're going to have all the descriptions of how you can get in contact with Chris, his team, access to docs for integrating this into your stack. We'll have all that in the description below. Also, I'm already t- I'm doing this on record here. We're going to have Chris and this team to help us to put together some great workshops. So that way you can start to experience yourself how this can be used, how you can leverage this, how this technology is really revolutionizing the world and really revolutionizing how people in underserved markets can engage with the Web3 ecosystem. So Chris, thank you so much. Until next time, everybody, take care.